hello out there, everybody, and happy Friday. I, this is really, really special for me, guys. I can't contain myself. It's a big day over here. It's our 100th episode. It's Friday, and it's always Friday with me. Stephen Fry, your SMB guy. I see why am I, in case you missed it. SMB stands for small and medium-sized business. For the last 20 years, I've been a consultant for SMBs, a voice and a sounding board for business leaders, advocating on their behalf, their employees too. You guys know it. I believe very strongly in sharing stories, providing perspective, and creating connection. So every single Friday, you could find me right here doing just that, lending what's left of my mind and my voice to this radio show where I interview SMB leaders and their trusted advisors. One thing that I've noticed over the years, everybody, some of the best thought leadership for SMBs, it actually happens on Friday, right about the time we feel that freedom of the weekend coming. However, we're also anxious to start the weekend. These crucial pearls of wisdom, they're often overlooked, they're forgotten in favor of our fun weekend activities and our freedom from work. Here on the show, we take advantage of that weekend freedom and clarity. We discuss popular topics that are on the minds of our SMB leaders and their trusted advisors. Once again, my last name, not just a play on words, my last name actually means free in German. So a little bit of method behind the madness for everybody. Again, major milestone this week. It's the 100th episode of the show. Producing and hosting this radio show has sort of felt like having another child, which brings back memories for me of my daughters and their friends dressing up for their hundredth day of school along their way in their centenarian costumes. For those of us uh, without kids or unfamiliar with this recent practice, the costumes are known as 100-year-old person costumes. The little girls, they look so cute, dressed in the floral print dresses, paired with comfy cardigan sweaters and spectacles. Well, it's obviously better than the alternative. Getting older is not easy, especially in the U.S., largely due to what we're going to talk about today, which is some of the horrors of the healthcare system. This past week, we celebrated Halloween, fun costumes, lots of candies, some horror movie marathons, one horror show that continues to rear its ugly head in the world of small, medium-sized business is the topic of healthcare. You guys have heard me say it plenty of times, top things on business owners' minds, business operating expenses, taxes, and health insurance, aside from you know, making millions of dollars, increasing revenue year over year, all that good stuff. Our special guest today is a renowned rheumatologist, not only helps patients treat persistent pain in the hips, knees, back, and or wrists, he is the go-to guy for doctors in the area who can't figure out what the hell is wrong with their patients. He also has a phenomenal staff that not only helps him with his Zoom shenanigans, they also have had some stellar costumes as well this past Halloween, so very cool. While we're on talkradio.myc, you guys know it, talk is cheap. We don't want this to just be talk. The goal here is let's use the insight on the business landscape and create some more impact on Monday morning. It is far too often the businesses that I talk with out there, they're focused on the product that's going to solve all of their problems. The shiny new mousetrap, the magic wand. One consistent thing I see out there is that products change every single day in everything that we do. Medicines change every single day, which the good doctor can attest to shortly. There's no substitute for having yourself surrounded by the right people, focusing on the process that's going to get you where you want to go. You do that, the right products will be there when you need them. Everything begins and ends with the people. So I'm very excited. I hope you guys are excited. I have the right person around me today. We are talking with none other than Dr. Stephen Soloway, MD, renowned rheumatologist, and author of Bad Medicine and Medical Politics. We're going to talk about the books in just a bit, but little bio behind the good doctor. Originally from New York City, the doctor completed his undergraduate studies at SUNY Stony Brook. In pursuit of this lifelong dream to be a physician, he attended the American University of the Caribbean School of Medicine in the British West Indies. Talk about what a party that must have been. London, Boston, Omaha, postgraduate training at Mercy Catholic Medical Center. Uh, I, his resume is so long. I, I honestly timed myself with, with the whole resume, and it took up the entire episode. So I'm not going to read off his entire resume, but doc, Dr. Soloway has dedicated his life to helping patients and his colleagues for decades now. The patients visit from six countries, many U.S. states and cities. The doctor's devotion to his patients' needs have earned him top doctor awards every year since 2003, and he's regarded as one of the leaders in the Philadelphia, New Jersey, and Delaware area for to logic care. 
Hopefully I said that nicely and correctly. He's now recognized as one of the top physicians in his field nationally by Philadelphia Magazine, Castle Connolly, and U.S. News and World Report. Industry leader sits on numerous boards and panels within the pharmacology industry, along with national advisory panels for all major companies involved in arthritis or osteoporosis research. He's known in the medical community as a medical detective and will proudly announce, if I can't fix you, I'll get you somebody that can. His vast experience is second to none. Recently nominated Chairman Department of Rheumatology Division of uh, Internal Medicine and Spira Health Network. I'll let him talk to you more about that. Dr. Soloway, not only involved in arthritis and osteoporosis treatment, but sports and occupational medicine as well. Runs osteoporosis, knee and back pain clinics. The good doctor enjoys giving back to the community through charity and by teaching doctors from several medical institutions in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. He's been board certified in internal medicine since 1991 and rheumatology since 1993 with specialized certificates in osteoporosis. The doc has plenty to say, so I'm going to keep my shenanigans to a minimum as best I can. You know, it's difficult for me. Uh, we are going to discuss my favorite questions, your favorite movie or TV show character, movie or TV show, your favorite musical instrument, and the artist you'd like to hear play it. Joining us from his home base in Southern New Jersey before he ships off to Miami for the latest stop on his book signing tour for his latest release, Medical Politics. Dr. Soloway, welcome to Always Friday, brother. Thank you for spending 100th episode with me. Uh, good morning. I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to be on your 100th episode. I want it to be your best. I want it to be your gold edition. I want it to be the standard that is set for your show. I want to thank you for having me. I want to send a thank you to Seth Feldman, who connected us. I, I also want to tell your listeners that, you know, I grew up in Queens, and this is a New York-based radio show. And I went to PS13 Queens back in the 60s, I think. Then I went to IS61, which was a middle school right in the heart of Corona, across the street from Left Rack City. Now, the good news is, they taught me, I guess, what I needed to know to go to high school. The bad news is I was the first and the middle and the last kid to be mugged so much that during ninth grade, my parents had to move to Long Island because I got mugged. Just I'm the, I'm the all-time leader in muggings and other things at IS61 Middle School, which may be a prison today. I don't know. But I, I hold the record for most muggings by being mugged, not mugging other people. So what an experience that was. Then along the Long Island Expressway, I was in ninth grade at the Newtown High School Annex, which should have been in Jackson Heights, but they had 4,000 kids per class and so on. So, okay, that's my, that's my real bio. That's my undercover bio. That's my graffiti bio. Oh, speaking of graffiti, back when I was in school, driving down the Cross Bronx Expressway when Howard Stern was really big into saying, hey, did you get trim? Well, I actually have a photograph of somebody who spray painted the ultimate graffiti trim. And I've got that photo since, uh, I don't know, 1977 or 78. So those were the days. <laughs> I, I know you have a ridiculous amount of stories, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear a bunch of them today. And yes, definitely thank you to Seth Feldman, the show doctor, for introducing us. Seth was also a, a guest on the show previously. You, you got to give us a little bit of your journey, man, especially from going to, to school in the Caribbean and what that must have been like. Tell us about how you got where you are today. Uh, well, the short answer is I took a plane down to the Caribbean and my dad you know, wrote a check. But in, in reality, you know, I'm a Jewish kid. Uh, born in New York City. So before I was born, I was going to be a doctor. The question was, you know, was it going to be an easy route or a hard route? And even through high school, I did okay. I went to Stony Brook. It was considered a good school. You needed like an 85 average. You needed an 1100 SAT. And I, when I got there, there was like 40,000 kids there. And I'm like, geez, okay. Well, you know, um, I do interviewing for people going to Stony Brook Medical School now. But when I was a student at Stony Brook, I was advised I couldn't be a doctor. So I said, well, what can I be? And they said, you can be a podiatrist. So I applied and got into podiatry school. I don't want that. Well, you could be a dentist. I got into two dental schools. I didn't want that. Chiropractor did that. DO school did that. All these things that weren't MD school, I applied and got into all of them. And it was, um, I think it was the Manchurian candidate in my mother that got me stimulated to say, look, you know what? 
it doesn't matter if I'm getting D's like uh, John Belushi in Animal House in every class, I'm focused on being a doctor. <laughs> so, you know, there might have been a party here and a, a party there, but I, I did, I really did work hard. And so somebody said to me, you know, are you, are you regretful, remorseful about your time at Stony Brook? Meaning like you didn't get into a US medical school, you know, your grades were not straight A's. And I said, wait a minute, Stony Brook, that was the greatest time of my life. I went to every party, I didn't miss any. I went to every girl, I didn't miss one. I played on every intramural sports team, I didn't miss any. I mean, what a better time in college. I mean, college is to go to learn and make your bed, learn to get away from your parents. It, who said you have to know biology? Because biology in college, hell, if I went back to college now, I'd, I want to be political science, philosophy. I want to be art history. I want to know everything. Right. I don't want to know about what fish eats sneakers, the batfish or the toadfish, you know? <laughs> so college was amazing then. So here's the bad news. Comes time to apply for medical school. And um, obviously, I, I didn't have the grades to go, you know, to downstate or, or New Brunswick or whatever the case may be. So we found an ad in the New York Times. It said, pay here and you're accepted. Well, you know, all kidding aside, my class started with 203 kids. A lot of them were retired veterinarians, dentists, whatever, really bright people that simply had a change in plans, midlife, whatever the case may be. I got down to that school and I said, gee, you know, if I don't do well here, how much bigger of a loser can I be? So I put my, <laughs> uh, put the pedal to the metal. I was in the library all day, Saturday and Sunday for, for literally two years. Some of the students would play softball on weekends. Some of them would go swimming. I made one trip to the volcano I, I made no trips to the um, plane crash that was up there since the 1960s. And I studied hard. I did very, very well. I excelled. I got A's and everything. Um, now, part of the thing is, is at Stony Brook, while I was getting a C in biochemistry, when I go to medical school, it was the same class. So, of course, I got an A in that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the reality is, there's nothing I learned in medical school in the first two years that has any applicable uh, knowledge or basis for what I do today. Now, the third and fourth year of medical school, which um, had me fly to London. Now, interestingly enough, the first two kids in the class back then, you know, the ones with the highest GPA, they were able to go to, I think, Chicago or Detroit. And the truth is, would you really want to be in Chicago or Detroit? I mean, London is a little bit of a nicer place. And, um, you know, those, I will tell you right now, and I mean this, um, I, I met my pal, Robert Pfefferman, doctor, endocrinology in, um, on the flight. We didn't know each other. We were in school together. We didn't know each other. It was a, it was a large class of a thousand people on the island from different classes. We met on the plane, became best friends. We moved in together when we got to London and, um, we, we studied hard and we found out that the didactic training, that would be the professor at the bedside with five students or three students. If you didn't go home with a headache, you were doing something wrong. They would say, look, you know, there's a spleen on the floor. Tell me five diseases where there's a spleen on the floor. And you better know them because if you didn't know them, you'd get smacked on the hand. Seriously. We, we hold, did hold that hold that thought. I studied abroad in London as well, and uh, I'm sure we could compare some fun notes on that. Mostly folks being in the pubs by 11 a.m. comparing notes. But uh, we do have to take a quick break. I know you have a ton to say, and I'm excited to hear it. And I hope everyone else is, too, because there's no substitute for experience like yours. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back with Dr. Stephen Soloway, M.D., renowned rheumatologist and author of Bad Medicine and Medical Politics. Stay with us. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? 
Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you on edge? Hey, we live in challenging, edgy times, so let's lean in. I'm Sandra Bargeman, the host of The Edge of Every Day, which airs each Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. Tune in live with me and my friends and colleagues as we share stories and perspectives about pushing boundaries and exploring our rough edges. That's The Edge of Every Day on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Welcome back, everybody. It's Friday. It's always Friday. It's 100 episodes of Always Friday, and it's me, Stephen Fry, your SMB guy. We're chatting with the good Dr. Soloway, renowned rheumatologist, author of the books Bad Medicine and the latest release, Medical Politics, currently potentially coming to a city near you for book signing. I know that Miami's next on the uh, on the train. But uh, before we get into the method behind Dr. Soloway's madness, I know he's going to have plenty to say about that. If you'll permit me, Doc, I like to sit out by the fire pit for just a minute, tell a quick story, perspective. Uh, since you've had some experience in Boston, the New England area, I visited Maine recently, so give you a little moment of zen out by the ocean there. I, I I really wanted to be a doctor for a long time, and it's lately I I realized that bad medicine is definitely not just a Bon Jovi tune for us Jersey boys. I discovered that I liked the occasional good time in high school, uh, led to me falling asleep in AP Biology senior year at seven thirty in the morning. So I kind of decided that the business world you know was was for me along the way. But some things that I've seen out there, it, it, they appear to make practicing medicine look very, very difficult. And I know you can attest to that, especially just given the, the landscape with the healthcare system. Working with the small, medium-sized businesses, as I alluded to earlier, healthcare is always something that's at top of mind for employers and employees. Kind of one of those basic things. If you're not healthy, you can't work. You can't make money. It's real, real freaking easy when you get down to it. But without the right partners to navigate, the insurance brokers, the service providers, HR professionals, all of that, it can be a ridiculous nightmare to deal with for a small, medium-sized business owner. But even when you have some of the best coverage out there, it could still be a nightmare. Some of the hoops that need to be jumped through just to ensure that there's proper coverage, they could be confusing as hell, they could take a long time, all while people are suffering. So what you do and how you do it, I, I, I place a lot of value on. Just candidly, doctor, I hope you noticed. I tried to put on my scrubs, but I love the green screen, so uh, I disappear with it when, you know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of a weird trick that I play. My wife is an attorney. She's a former medical malpractice attorney, and I remember her thoughts, like when she was work, had to deal with any of the rheumatologists along the way. The only thing she would say is, you almost have to be a little crazy, right? And I, and I know you're, you're, you're a cool dude, so we have a lot that we could talk about about crazy, but... Patients can be crazy for sure. There's no doubt about that. And, but some of the conditions that they have that they've been misdiagnosed with or they've been run through the ringer with of unnecessary tests for insurance, that might have driven them crazy. So I know that no one's more equipped to deal with this topic than you, but the method part of the show, the science behind what you do, we're not going to teach people how to be doctors in, a, in one segment here, but the idea is to give color on what do you do? How do you do it? And how do you go to market for it? Aside from being a kick-ass personality and an author to boot, lay it on us. What's your method behind your madness? Sheesh. You threw a lot at me on that one. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. You got to be motivated from within. You must have a staff that you treat as a family. You must remember 
that the lowest person on the totem pole must feed their family. And if you can keep a group together and make them a family, it's better than your own family where you hate three cousins and you want to kill six uncles or something like that. So you get together a group of people and it, you know it's really irrelevant if they're educated or not because the only thing they need to be educated in is what do you do at your practice and what do you need done from them? So I could bring a lawyer on full time, but if they're a real estate lawyer, they're not going to really be able to help me. Right. So I might as well get somebody cheaper than a lawyer who can learn medical law, et cetera. So you need, you need the infrastructure in place. Now, on top of the infrastructure, you need to offer the services that your patients, or at least the patients that you feel will require uh, certain things. So I draw a fluid from a knee. The first thing that has to be done with it is it has to be looked at under a certain microscope. Well, I have to have the microscope because if I don't have the microscope, then the insurance company may turn around and leverage that against me and say, dude, you don't have a microscope. Why would we even have you on our staff? It doesn't matter that you're board certified with a state license and it doesn't matter that you know everything, but how can you possibly diagnose the patient if you don't have the tools at your office? So sure. you, have your, you have your staff infrastructure and then you have your physical infrastructure, whether it's your x-ray machine, whether it's your microscope, whether it's your syringe, your needle, your medicines that you use on a daily basis. If you have all that in place and you have a good cup, for those of you who aren't Jewish, good head on your shoulders. For those of you who have a good head on your shoulders and have good direction and good focus, um, you can go very far. However, here's, what, here's what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years, like 15 years. We talk about, um, you know, you, you actually hit a key word, you know, those who have the best insurance. So let me just make something very clear. Everybody who comes to me has the best doctor. You know why I know that? They tell me, I went to this <laughs> Ivy League school or I've, here, I've heard this. I've gone to Mayo, Hopkins, Mass General, Penn, blah, blah. I have the best. Well, if they're the best, why are you here? Apparently I'm the best if you're here. So let's get it clear. Nobody, no matter what they think and no matter how much they love their doctor, they could even be having a sexual relationship. They don't have the best. There is no such thing as a best doctor. Yes. Um, the other thing, if you think you have the best insurance, sorry, you better go see a psychiatrist because all insurances are created equal. Their job with the help of government overreach is to collect your copay and not pay out when you need something paid for, because that's how capitalism is, except when the government is overreaching and the government is sent, setting guidelines how to audit with bounty hunters, the highest tier of billing doctors, these guys now lose their incentive to work hard. Instead of a doctor who works hard and sees 50 people a day, maybe somebody should thank them and interview them and ask them, what, what's your business model? How do, you, how do you get through so many people in a cohesive fashion? You know, what, what is, what's your way of doing it? You know, my way of doing it is, oh, you know, I have a really smart, the best medical assistant. Why is she the best? Well, she's a good listener. She doesn't forget anything. And if I tell her something, she does it. So that makes her the best. So if you have a person with you, you can actually look at the patient. Now, if you've been to the doctor recently, you'll notice that that little guy from Southeast Asia who's not looking at you is typing as fast as possible because he's working for a system and he's on a 15 minute uh, time limit. And if he misses the time limit, he gets demerits. Now let's just pretend they hired the, the best and they brought in the best guy for gastroenterology. I'll just throw that one out as a, you know, a field. And let's just pretend the guy's making $500,000 a year and let's just pretend that the average in that field is 350,000. Well, those doctors, they lose their motivation. Why? Well, the guy performs double the work and he should get a 500,000 bonus on top of his 500,000 salary, except then the system turns around and they say, you know, we're not gonna give you a bonus, but why? I, I did all this. Yeah, but you know, the average in your field is 350. We already gave you 500, so we're not giving you a bonus. But wait, that's not in the contract. Yes, but it doesn't say we have to give you the bonus. It just says this is the bonus structure. 
It doesn't say you're going to get it. See, so this is where you need a lawyer who's really experienced in reading between the lines very, very well, because their team of lawyers, which is subsidized by the government, I'll explain that. Um, well, why don't I just explain how the government gets their hand in there? So 15 years ago, there were, let's say, a million doctors and there were a thousand hospitals. Well, now what they've done by giving money to the hospital system, especially the system that has trainees or students. All right, we're going to give you $130,000 for each person being trained at your institution. You pay them 50, you keep the 80, 80 times 100 is a ton. And you know what, we can use that ton to buy our helicopter, because you know, if there's an important meeting, we can't sit in traffic with the peasants. And by the way, in my book, I define class one, two, and three peasants versus type one and two, type two billionaires. So you see, we, we can't, we, we have to go right up to that low level billionaire class. And we, we leave the peasants behind getting on our corporate helicopter because the government gave us so much money that we're gonna do a good job and we're motivated to buy up every doctor in town. And by buying them up, we pay their salary. And if we don't like the way they operate and if they refer more to him than him, we'll fire him. And then if we fire him, he has to go to another town because there's no other hospital system around. So this is a problem. Now, if you're a plastic surgeon in New York City, as long as you're doing a good job, you're gonna make $100,000 a day and they're gonna pay cash. They're gonna come from Saudi Arabia. They're gonna come from wherever you're going to make your money. So those people are making 10 million or more. No problem, no issues, no audits, maybe IRS audits, but certainly no, you know, we all have to get IRS audits. But why is it because you're in medicine, you're so overregulated that if you're, if you're in that top 10% of billers, which means 95% of you people in that 10% are hard workers. And yes, there's always a small group of bad eggs that are ripping off the system. Honestly, it's not that hard to find out who's ripping off the system. You just need to know how to look and where to look. And frankly, generally, the patients will tell you because there'll be 65 complaints about yep. the one doctor who says, you know, you have to take off your bra before I can look in your eye. Said, what? <laughs> I mean, no, I, listen, I spent years on different boards. This stuff goes on. It really does. But when you said that, it reminded me of a T-shirt that I've had along the way. It says, trust me, I'm a doctor. Exactly, exactly. But the truth is, this is real stuff and you can't make it up. And, you know, the things that I've seen are just um, some despicable, but nobody has the best doctor. There is no such thing as the best hospital. There's no such thing as the best insurance. You find who's right for you, who's going to work for you and fight with your insurance company on your behalf so you can get the medicine that you need that your doctor believes in, not what they have on their formulary to pay for cheaper. Yeah, ab absolutely. This this topic is one that 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 hits home with me a great deal. In fact, I've uh, I've I've interviewed uh, some members of the chiropractic integrative health and wellness practice that I've visited over the years, and they they're in New Jersey. They're not in New York City. They flat out do not take insurance. Now, most people, when I'm talking to small, medium sized businesses, as I do all the time, it's like, oh, they don't take my insurance. Well, I can't go see them then. It's like I'm going to pay completely out of pocket. The irony of all of that is when you're going through insurance for a lot of different specialties, you have to do test after test after test in a particular order with the particular equipment, everything like you were saying, just to get the coverage that you're looking for. And, it, and especially in chiropractic, it almost, it almost incentivizes the whole system to be like, oh, well, you need to come back and see me twice a week for the next 20 years where if somebody's doing it on a fee type of basis and it's out of pocket and it's no insurance and they even offer unlimited visits on a monthly basis, they're incentivized to keep you out of pain. My solution to this is understand that when you buy health insurance, you're really just buying an umbrella that if you, God forbid, get in the hospital for an extended period of time and the bill gets up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know that your insurance is really only for that because whether it's the chiropractors you spoke of or whether it's my office or whoever's office doing an x-ray or a shot or whatever, yes, that bill may be $500, but your insurance may not cover it. They may not approve of it. They, and they all have different reasons, but just know that the reason you have that insurance is legitimately, I always say your parts 
lose their warranty at age 30. Your engine light comes on when you're 50. <laughs> so if you're between 35 and 50 or older, you have to have hospital coverage so that if you're stuck in the hospital for a long time with either cancer or whatever, you know, that six month bill is going to be a um, million dollars. And you need to know that your responsibility is five or 10,000 max, and then you're done. That, yep. That's the truth. Nobody yep. has anything the best, but you need that coverage. It's something I've said on the show. My guests have said along the way, there is no such thing as perfection. Although people are always pursuing it, it's progress, not perfection. We're going to take a quick break, but we will be right back with Dr. Stephen Soloway, MD, renowned rheumatologist and author of Bad Medicine and Medical Politics. Stay with us. Are you passionate about the conversation around racism? Hi, I'm Reverend Dr. TLC, host of the Dismantle Racism Show, which airs every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Join me and my amazing guests as we discuss ways to uncover, dismantle, and eradicate racism. That's Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauber, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Welcome back to Always Friday with me, Stephen Fry, your SMB guy. It's not just me. It's the good Dr. Stephen Soloway, MD, renowned rheumatologist and author of the books Bad Medicine and the latest release, Medical Politics. Doc, this is the part of the show where we like to talk about the madness that's out there. And I know you've got plenty of it to talk about, but this is the artistic observational view, the stories that you have from the field, no subject too taboo, anything goes. You've given me some sprinklings of some here and there. By the way, I'm a big car guy and I know you are too. Some of the cars that you told me you have, you know, talk about madness. Who the hell has a 1976 police cruiser? Uh, Dr. Soloway. Yes, you do. Yeah. And by the way, I want you to know that the um, the walkie talkie works, the radar detector works, the lights work. And because it's a highway interceptor and cruiser, the lights go up six feet. Um, you can have the lights and the dashboard in the back go -do 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 -do, while those other ones are going crazy. And then you got the cherries flipping on top. So um, when I acquired this, I told the town mayor and the police chief, you know, guys, I have this. So if you see me driving around, I don't want you to think there's some nut with a stolen police car. <laughs> so they gave me a list. They gave me a list of all the events in town, like for community service. Sure. So that, that episode out there where you see the car is I was at an, uh, I was at a, um, it was Halloween, uh, for the kids, I guess. I mean, not for the, not, I guess. It was a Halloween thing for the kids that the city puts on, the city of Vineland. And um, they call it trunk or treat. Sure. So so this is insane. We filled up the trunk of this car with almost a thousand dollars worth of candy. And awesome. there were like 50 or 75 cars there. L literally, I mean, seriously, if if we didn't run out of candy, the kids would still be there. Their parents would have come, their grandparents, everybody who needed candy. They weren't going to Walmart that night. They were coming to Trunk or Treat. 
<laughs> I too have attended some of the trunk or treats with my daughters and uh, my wife is now having me donate the lion's share of the candy to local places that could use it so I can actually fit into some of my clothes moving forward instead of the scrubs <laughs> I tried to put on. I love it. I love but, it. But let's go back to some of the madness that is your life. You know, you told me a story. I don't know if it was reflexive of this picture I found out there. The idea of... It's a good looking picture. It's a good looking picture, obviously. Come on now. For 40 years of tears cured in one visit. Yeah, I, I know you have a couple of stories that are like this, yeah. but there was one that you told me yesterday about something. So a guy that was in pain and you you found a, a, a fatty you know lipoma inside oh, of him. Oh, yeah. It, yeah was yeah. it was it this one or was it was it something else? No, no, this is something totally. Else. OK, well, I want to hear it all. So give it to oh, everybody. Okay. Let's hear some madness. All right. So the, the 40 years in pain lady was um, if I off the top of my head, I'm going to say she's about 55 years old. She came here. And um, she walked in frustrated because she knows that she's been to, you know, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Cornell, Stanford, yeah. uh, Mayo Clinic. Cleveland Insert Clinic. Ivy League here. Yeah. So she's been to all those places. And see, what people don't understand is when you go to one of those institutions, you're usually met with a student who really doesn't even know doesn't know anything, frankly, knows how to check off the boxes. Um, do you have green eyes? Ma'am, do you have green eyes? Uh, hold on, let me check the mirror. Um, the right eye green, left eye brown. And, and that's how it goes. And that'll take two hours at a, at a big institution. And then after that, that student has to go and talk to the next level up, which is usually called an intern. And then they talk to the resident and then they talk to the fellow. Now the fellow is when you're actually training within the field but you're not an attending. So my first year that I graduated out of my fellowship, I became an attending. So I'm an attending right now for 30 years. So you're getting people that have had negative years. Student, he hasn't reached that level. Intern, no. Fellow, resident, they're not there yet. You spend the whole day and you see, well, say, well, when am I going to meet the chairman, the guy with, you know, the guy between 50 and 70 who's written the books, who knows everything? Oh, he, he's in he's in um, London lecturing this week to a group of British rheumatologists. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden the face goes, huh? I've heard this at every other place. So they come here and all they go, they, they only have me. And so this woman, when she did her video, which was, you know, filmed live here, she said, you know, um, she said I was laser focused. She says that I was um, very spot on with my questions, that none of my questions were a waste of her time. Because when I read over her notes and so on, and I realized how much time had gone by, I already formulated in my head that she's either the biggest psycho in the world and lying to everybody, or she has a real disease and it has to fit into, you know, A, B, C, or D. So I asked her every question for A, B, A, B, C, or D. I examined her. I poked on her belly. I did this. I did that. Ordered tests. She came back for one visit. And by the way, before the visit, I apologize, before the follow-up, I started her on some medication because I really felt bad for her. She was really suffering. She came back and, you know, we don't want people to come back before the results. So at 45 days, she says, you know, this is the first 45 days since I'm 12 years old that I've been out of pain. And um, at that visit, we did uncover a genetic defect to her disease, and she's now on that medicine, and life is great for her. She's having a normal life. But wait, I'm going to interrupt myself to tell you another really cool story, and then I'll get to the guy who I told you about yesterday. Yep. I, I had a guy come here um, 20 years ago, and um, for whatever reason, and I don't remember the details, the guy came here. And we checked him for osteoporosis. So there are many occasions where you'll check a man for osteoporosis. Maybe they shrunk, you know, an inch or two or three, sure. or maybe they broke a bone inappropriately or, or something. So I tested the man for osteoporosis. His bone density was, was horrible. It was the worst I ever could even imagine. You know, it was like he didn't have any bones, basically. So I said, okay, this needs a serious evaluation. So I go through the evaluation. And one of the things you look, if, if a man has very low testosterone. I'm sorry. If a man has the very low bone density, you want to make sure they have hormones. So the guy's testosterone level was zero, not, not 15 or 20 when normal zero. Is two, 250 to 850 is normal. The guy was zero. Okay. 
So we're talking about a guy who has a zero. So I said to him, you know, you told me that you have two kids. I said, you know, when do you think it changed? He goes, well, you forgot to ask me. They're adopted. Oh. So lo and behold, we did some testing and he had a, um, I mean, in the world of medicine, it would be more common than the other rare diseases. But this guy had Kleinfelter syndrome, which he had, he was born with it. And because of that, he got placed on testosterone. And at the age of 55, he went through puberty for the first time. Okay, true story, can't make it up. Now, I Whoa. gotta tell, yeah, I wanna get in this other one. Yes. So I don't see patients on Friday. Friday is my paperwork day, fight with insurance company day, write letters and deal with lawyers. But um, if a friend, family, or a doctor calls me and says, can you fit in so-and-so, I'm going to see them on Friday. Yeah. I saw a man during the week who literally looked worse than Quasimodo. In fact, his shoulder was higher than his head. And uh -oh. I said, gosh, what's going on with that? He says, well, you know, nobody will touch it because I have bad insurance. And, and I said, of course, what do you mean? You have the best insurance. Everyone has the best. He said, no, no, <laughs> you know, I have, I, I have shitty insurance. Nobody wants me. So I felt it. And I said, you know, I think it's just a lipoma. A lipoma is, um, we have lipoma formers and we have non-formers. So if you're a former, you make these big clumps of fat and they take a shape of their own. Like you can have something growing like a grapefruit and it's just a piece of fat. Yep. So I said to him, you come here on a Friday when I'm not stressed out and busy, and I'm going to take it out for you. He said, really, really? So uh, my assistant and I, we got out all the tools. Um, you know, we have plenary license. We can do medicine or surgery, whatever we want. I cut the guy about 12 inches from his neck to his shoulder, and I made an opening. And I put my hands in the guy, uh, elbows deep. And I came out with this thing, and I held it up like this. And it was about four or five feet long, weighed about 25 pounds. It was nothing but a piece of fat. It was a giant lipoma. As soon as it came out of his back, the guy took a breath. He says, this is the first time in 20, 30 years that I could take a deep breath. I said, you see that? You came here. I did it for free. And all these guys hated your insurance. So maybe the best insurance is having a nice personality. Yeah. And have, having the right people around you at all times, not the not what is commonly looked at as a product with insurance, which, well, by the way, is something that I struggle with all the time. A lot of times, depending on the size of the business, you know, they might pass me off to HR you know, f folks and whatnot. It's like th there was an article that came out a few years back talking about how the health insurance decisions for a business, it should be an owner C-suite type of discussion because it's well, a big deal. <laughs> Here's something to throw in real quick here. Why is it that when every year comes on a certain date, you get a thing, it says renewing your insurance, the rates went up 12%. Did you know your doctor gets cut every year for the last 17 years for office visits? How come, I mean, and I'm not saying I'm not going to do this, but I think going forward, my new plan is going to be to call the insurance company every year or two and say, oh no, I'm not signing that contract until I get a 10% increase. Because how am I supposed to absorb, you know, losing 10% when I'm paying more, you won't give me more. This, you know, this is another big, big um, black hole in the system where things are just like, nobody looks at this stuff. Nobody thinks about it. And if it's not a congressional hearing, you know, that has something to do with a personal interest, like insider trading, which is allowed. I mean, if you're, if you're in the know, you know how to insider trade, you're allowed. You and me. We'd be looking at the ceiling and the bars. Oh, man, the guy made 100 grand on the insider trade. But the dude who made a million on Google, no problem. No problem at all. I mean, somebody it's, might come after him with a hammer, but that's okay. You're delving into an area of madness that we're going to need another couple of episodes <laughs> for, which we, we might be able to make happen very shortly. But in the meantime, we got to take a break. We'll be right back with Dr. Stephen Soloway, MD, renowned rheumatologist and author of Bad Medicine and medical politics. Stay with us, everyone. Hey, everybody. It's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector, coming at you from my attic. 
Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy in Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. In a post-COVID world, you may have many unanswered questions regarding your health. Are you looking to live a healthier lifestyle? Do you have a desire to learn more about mental health and enhance your quality of life? Or do you just want to participate in self-understanding and awareness? I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each Thursday, I will tackle these questions and work to enlighten you. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will be Frank About Health to advocate for all of us. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Welcome back to Always Friday with me, Stephen Fry, your SMB guy. Episode 100, we're sharing it here today with my new friend, Dr. Stephen Soloway, MD, renowned rheumatologist and author of the books, Bad Medicine and Medical Politics. Medical Politics, hot off the presses. The good doctor is leaving for Miami Beach in the morning for his book signing and book distribution event, seven o'clock tomorrow evening at the Setai in Miami Beach. Doc, you've given us some some gr- int- very interesting thoughts here that promote another episode or five that we need to get going on. But it, it's a very complex world. Even people within the industry, whether they're a doctor, an insurance carrier, an insurance broker, an HR professional, a lot of times they're still trying to figure out what the hell's going on in this industry, just like you're trying to figure out what's going on with some of the patients that have been referred to you by other colleagues and doctors in the industry. There's a, there's a lot of things that I think about when it comes to messaging from somebody like you. You have some, you have some great testimonials out there. I would urge everyone to go to drsoloway.com, S-O-L-O-W-A-Y for those of you out there who have some spelling issues. But for the, uh, the message side of things, you, know, you you say, walk into the week without pain. I think that's a great thought, especially for listeners of my show and people who have small, medium-sized businesses. They get really clear and get, get some execution done on Friday. They clear their plate, and then they come back on Monday, and they are trying to figure out what the hell they did the week before. And it's, it's almost like starting a little bit of pain all over again. Have a, have a response and have a way to, to deal with that with your body and your business. Manage the pain. Live your life. You gave us some great examples of that. But also, everyone is different, right? Like, you can't generalize this type of thing. That's something I see all the time with people focusing on products and apps and magic wands to, to try to figure things out. You know, people are like, I have arthritis. I'm getting a little older. It's like you, you'll have it yourself in your content. There's over a hundred different types of arthritis. There's probably more than that that you could tell me about. All of them probably need to be treated a different way. But give us some of the sound bites that people need to remember this weekend. What do you want people to remember during their cocktails and football watching on Monday morning? Sound bite number one. You're very correct. If people come to my office, I cannot cookie cut and I cannot pigeonhole because. No two people have the same problem and all the problems to a degree are treated differently, even if it is an art, not a science. And I'll explain. However, if you go to an urgent care or an emergency room where they are trained specifically to treat heart attacks, strokes, and the urgent care of a true emergency, if you go to an emergency room on a Sunday,
Doc, did I lose you? I don't know if that's me or you. Doc, you there? Well, seem to have lost the good doctor. Hope you guys can can hear me out there. Uh, sometimes that happens with me, like right about this time of day, the internet somehow goes out to my house. But uh, yeah, you know, live radio, always something that we got to contend with. I know uh, the good doctor has some has some great sound bites for you guys, and we'll make sure that we get them to you. Hopefully comes back online in just a second, or we put them in the show notes. But there are no two people created equally with with something like what what dr soloway does you can't pigeonhole you can't generalize you can't stereotype you can have a couple of thoughts but you can never judge a book by its cover right and the same is it's true with a lot of the business folks that I deal with, whether they're a trusted advisor or they're actually running their own practice, their own enterprise. It's, uh, it's, it's just not that cookie cutter, especially when you're talking about people's individual bodies and their individual health, but also like just the individual demographics of each business. Each, each business is its own kind of unique entity. Even though, as we've discussed many times here, they might perform similar services and provide the same types of products out there. You know, it's, it's, it's just not the same. Everybody has a little bit of a different story, a different demographic of folks, different census information, and they have all kinds of different needs, wants, and wish lists. And you have to be able to cater to that as much as possible. It's a big part of my world, you know, business solutions consulting. And, you know, really, it's, it's part of Dr. Soloway's world, too, as far as being as consultative as possible to both his colleagues in the industry that, uh, you know, send, send folks with un, uh, unknown issues and, and, you know, treatment needs that, that might not be as evident. They, they send it over to Dr. Soloway to be that medical detective and to try to figure things out. I, I very often find myself in the same position of trying to, to figure things out with the different businesses that I, that I work with out there and definitely the folks that, uh, that I interview here on the show. There's, there's a, lot to be, uh, a lot to be said for, for everybody being its own individual unique entity as a person and as a business where a lot of the, uh, the good discussion happens at the crossroads. It's things that remain constant in our personal lives will remain constant in our business lives if you want to be successful. So I know, know the doctor's trying to work on coming back right now. I did receive a text from him just now. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the awesome answers that the doctor gave for the questions that I asked. So I always ask all 100 episodes that I've done, who is your favorite movie or TV show character? What's your favorite movie or TV show? And what's your favorite musical instrument? And who's the artist you'd like to hear play it? So without further ado... You know, the good doctor and almost like uh, like the attorneys that I speak with out there, it, he couldn't he couldn't give me a straight answer to a lot of these questions. But I love the way that he answered them. His favorite movie or TV show character. He's in love with the fictional Miss New Jersey herself from the Miss Congeniality movie, Sandra Bullock. He, uh, he didn't say a favorite movie in any way, shape or form. He just wants to marry her. And by the way, the good doctor is single. So there he is. He's got some help with Zoom and all that. Hey, don't worry, Doc. It happens to me sometimes. The internet goes out to my studio right in the middle of a live feed. So don't worry about it. It's all good. We're talking to everybody just about the uh, about the answers you gave me. So I, I know you're in love with Sandra Bullock and uh, you would you would it seems like you would marry her if you had the chance. But yes, yes. I, I think of you know, movies that have been on as of late that remind me of her. I think of Demolition Man. I don't know if you saw that one, but you know she she looks oh, she, she looks yeah, pretty yeah, pretty yeah. good in that movie. And then uh, Speed also, you know, definite favorite. Those are the ones that come to mind for me. You probably think more of the proposal because you're in love. I like the one where she put the uh, the syringe to the guy's neck when she was in the hospital. <laughs> uh, I'm not good with the name of that one. Well, all, all the all all the the two weeks notice movies and everything. Uh, you you. Could pull off you grant probably you know but it's uh, it, yeah it might, might be a little bit of a reach but i'll let you know she has been divorced from jesse james for a little bit now so you might have a shot maybe she's got some type of arthritis condition that you could help her out with who the hell knows well other uh, than that maybe she doesn't have any arthritis and i could teach her about it <laughs> well, well we'll find out one way or another by uh by ways of my network we'll see what what she's what she's playing with but oh yeah you know, ma matchmaking services also included here your favorite movie you didn't stripes. really. You didn't really hesitate. You went straight to stripes. Oh, come on! <laughs> My name is Francis Sawyer. If any of you people call me Francis, I'll kill you. 
<laughs> yeah, stri stripes for those out there who haven't seen it, it's two friends who are dissatisfied with their jobs they decide to join the army for a bit of fun and i know a few people personally who actually are doctors who joined the army way back in the day i'm not sure they did it for fun but huh. just knowing you at this point i could totally see you doing that if it didn't limit your schedule of having a good well time. yeah i mean look if, if i could be in the mud wrestle instead of john candy why wouldn't i be <laughs> and you know if i could be playing with the uh, the pancake thing in in the general's house why wouldn't i be so you started rattling off a bunch of other movies. The one that I thought was funny that you brought up was Police Academy because oh. it's, it's a group of good-hearted, hearted, complete misfits that enter the academy, <laughs> and the instructors aren't necessarily going to put up with the pranks, probably like some of the pranks that you and your buddies conducted in medical school and beyond. But I love this series of movies, and you and I were talking about the first movie for the most part. But uh, you know, my brother and I talk in movie quotes all the time. It's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm big on movies. But I, I, I was thinking about Officer Zed from 3 and 4 and beyond, Bobcat Goldthwait's character. When you started talking about it, I kept thinking of Zed saying, you dudes are setting a bad example. Yeah, and yeah. it's somewhat like the bad example of the healthcare system of take, <laughs> yeah. for, not, for like not taking care of patient needs first and worrying about all the mechanics of the insurance carriers and everything. That and the fact that you have a 1976 police cruiser is pretty fucking funny, actually. But uh, yeah, that's that. Those are, that's some great stuff. As far as the music goes, you also didn't really give me an answer for that. But when I, when we were talking, just because of your your books, Bad Medicine and Medical Politics, again out now. Yeah, if you guys want any books that are signed, you can email books at drsoloway.com, By the way, um, this no, no, uh, book book singular book book. Sorry, B O O K. Those of you out there, drsoloway.com. D R Soloway. At drsoloway.com. Yeah. I kept thinking of Motley Crue. Oh, because oh, Mick, oh God. Be, because Mick Mars, Mick Mars suffers from ankylosing spondylitis. And the only reason I know that is because I read the book and saw the movie The Dirt. That's how I learned about that condition. Oh, I think I told you about my little story with Motley Crue yesterday. It's probably not... Uh... Well, you did. I'll give everybody the quick summary of it is that the good Dr. Soloway was trying to compete with Tommy Lee for love interests, which is very difficult if you've seen some of Tommy Lee's exploits. But, uh, you yeah. know, the good, the good doctor knows how to work some magic. That's for that's for sure. I lost that battle, though. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Soloway dot com. There's lots and lots of fun testimonials out there. You know, one thing I'll say about about the book Bad Medicine, you see some of this co the commentary out there. It's been out for a couple of years. Bad Medicine is a must read for anyone concerned about the future of America's healthcare system. And that was said by Chris Christie, former governor of New Jersey. So that's you know, there's a lot around this whole topic. And again, Doc, I appreciate you being here, especially for my 100th episode. Great time, great stories. Sorry the internet went out on you for a second, but hey, shit happens. I can't believe the time went so fast. I love this. this that's is that's, like that's how it is, man. Everybody goes, we're going to talk for an hour, and then they go, wow, that went by really fast. But it is time for the next show here on the network, so I do have to say goodbye. You know, we are going to work on 100 more episodes of Always Friday, so look forward to that with all of you guys. Have a great weekend. We will see you next week, Friday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, right here on talkradio.myc. Take care, love Doc. You guys. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>